I'd like to thank you for inviting me on the show. It's such an honour to be here and I'd just like to say that when I'm not playing Xbox with my mate Thor, I really like to listen to my favourite podcast, Pop Culture Pasta. Hey Doug! Doug! Oh, that's right, Doug's dead. Pop Culture Pasta Hey Cody. That's my name. How exactly is a rainbow made? How exactly does the sun set? How exactly does the positive track rear end on a Plymouth work? All questions that won't be answered here today. It just does. <laughs> it <laughs> just <laughs> does. <laughs> uh, hello, hello. This is Pop Culture Pastor, the podcast. My name is Dave. Cody's here. I am. We also have Geek of the Roundtable, Justin John with us. Justin. Hello, everyone. It's good to be back. Welcome back. You can't back. hear my clap because it's a golf clap. Okay, Ooh. very good, very good. Cody is just more sophisticated than I am. I'm wearing a Joe Classy. Dirt shirt. So. Joe Dirte shirt. Dirt shirt. And that's that fits because that's what we're talking about today on the pod. This is yeah. a Be Kind Rewind on Joe Dirt here just in time for the 4th of July firecrackers. Joe Dirt's favorite. Uh, but we'll get to that because, as always, we're going to start off with the news Joel Osteen's in the news today. This is a weird. We don't usually start off with the Joel Osteen with a pastor, a preacher like uh, us. Uh, we're, I don't want to say we're using that loosely. But he's about as pop culture as a church representative as you can get, right? Who's more pop culture? Is, does, uh, verdict, does verdict count? Yeah, sure, it's, verdict counts. I think if the authors, because they're both pastors, but the authors of the Left Behind people. Books. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. I don't even remember their names. I have purposely yeah. blocked LaHaye it out. LaHaye and someone else. Jenkins, <laughs> I think. Yeah. <laughs> Anyways, we don't talk about other pastors hardly at all on this pod. All, and I can't even remember where, where we brought it up before. Maybe we brought up Joel because Cody stole his catchphrase. Name it and claim it, That's buddy. Right. I think we use it better, but, <laughs> you know. But sometimes I feel like bringing up this certain pastors – because it's almost like a public service announcement to say, hey, no offense to Joel, but understand that he does not represent the vast majority of us <laughs> that call ourselves pastors. Yes. So Joel made news today on a tweet or whatever they're called now. X marks the spot. <laughs> X. He said this. It's the simple things in life that bring us the most joy. You may not have a lot of resources, but if you have family, you're blessed. If you have your health, you're blessed. If you can look up at the stars at night, you're blessed. Now, on the surface, seems like a pretty innocuous tweet. Yeah, sounds pretty good. Uh, it's not. He got roasted pretty fast. Ooh. Little background. A um, little bit justified. Osteen's there I say. estimated net worth is at least $50 million. His two homes in Texas have a combined value of $13 million. <laughs> Among the responses to this tweet, if you can look up at those stars from the balcony of your mansion, you're Joel Osteen. <laughs> uh, this response, you donating your salary then? Uh, another response, this is the Farmers for Democracy, which, proud organization. Yeah, Joel, your multi-million dollar mansions and $350,000 Maserati are, quote, the simple things in life. I think I can enjoy those simple things, too. <laughs> Melanie De Arrigo says, Joel Osteen, worth $100 million dollars, Living in multiple mansions and owning multiple yachts wants you to know that money won't bring you joy, but he still wants you to send him all the money you can. I mean, to be fair, money doesn't bring you joy. There's plenty yeah. of proof for that. So I know where some people's mindsets go initially because he is a pastor he, and he has all this huge net worth. It's like, oh, don't send your money to churches because they're just paying their pastors out the wazoo. Mm. Uh, shockingly, that is not the case. A massive chunk of Joel's net worth actually comes from his books and his public speaking. But him keeping a fair share of that net worth does not look well, especially when you tweet out stuff like this. <laughs> um, now, if he had prefaced it with, I have all the monies. <laughs> and what I've learned is... It doesn't help your mental, physical, or spiritual health at all. 
Yeah. So like he should have gone like a Solomon route with it. With full like, Ecclesiastes. Like, yeah. Like I, I have all these things. I've done all these things. It doesn't. It, it's it, meaningless. Yeah. 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 Like if yeah. you would have gone that way or if you would have been like, like after selling stuff and like donating it to, you know, all these things or whatever, you know, then says like, I've come to realize it, it all means nothing. Mm. But then my dear friend Joel would have probably gotten roasted slightly differently with, well, if it means nothing to you, it definitely would mean a little bit more to me. So send it to this address. <laughs> P.O. Box. Mm. Yeah, it's just a, it made news, made some headlines. So I figured a quick little disclaimer. The vast majority of churches and pastors do not live like Joel. I'm still asking for an Xbox Series S or X. Oh, all right. either one. Yeah. He's not picky. I am not. Cody, name it and claim it. I'm naming it and claiming it now. It's <laughs> happening <laughs> within the next eight months. Let's move to real pop culture here. Uh, I want to talk about Al Pacino. Oh, Al Pacino said Albert? some crazy things this past week. Uh, would you believe that, well, number one, Al Pacino believes that his career is dead or hurt or was close to it, and it was Adam Sandler's fault. You hear about this? No. Yes, okay. and I do have thoughts about this. All right. Al Pacino was being interviewed uh, by the president of physical media. I don't even know what that is, but no. that's who he's being interviewed. And he started talking about how his career was almost destroyed by the 2011 Adam Sandler flick, Jack and Jill commercial failure. It was a critical failure of, as well. Score of 3% on the tomato meter, 36% on the audience score and swept the Razzies that year, like won every Razzie award <laughs> that you could possibly win. Full of bizarre stuff, Al Pacino dancing to the tune of Dunkin' Donuts, even changing his name to Dunkachino. Did you guys actually see Jack and Jill? No. No. I did I not. I passed hard on that yeah. one. Uh, he said this, quote, after Jack and Jill, it went silent. No one would take me serious anymore until Marty, our friend Marty, Scorsese, and the Irishman saved me. It was one of the most humiliating moments of my life. Cody, I'll let you I'll let you give your thoughts on this because I have some thoughts too. Your career was in the pooper before this movie. And the reason why you took it besides the money was because your career was garbage. For what it's worth, he says he took it because he wanted to elevate bad movies. If anything, he said he was being too egotistical because well, he thought he could purposely take bad movies and elevate them. Al Maybe back in the 80s. I disagree with your assessment. I don't think his career was damaged at all. He's Al freaking Pacino. I'm saying his career was damaged long time before this movie ever came out. He had a run of garbage after garbage after garbage. And if it wasn't for Marty, you couldn't say that he's done anything in the 2000s that has been remarkable or rememberable. I think it's... You need to pick better movies, Albert. Yeah, it's a strange flex no matter what, because either his career was already trash or his career is fine. I tend to think I'm like, no, he's Al Pacino. I, I mean, who's who wouldn't want Al Pacino in their movie if there was a part for him? Even uh, now, like, is it someone being like, oh, not Al. He was in that Sandler flick. Lots of people are in Sandler flicks. Has anyone ever said, like, my career is in the pooper because of Adam Sandler? Cody just said it. <laughs> I, I don't think that's, that's <laughs> not true, not man. say that. Like, that's impossible. I mean, Jack I, and Jill was pretty bad. I mean, it was bad. What are you expecting? I guess my point is this. Nobody went Al Pacino, world-class actor, stopped being a world-class actor because he was in an Adam Sandler flick. No. No, you know when you're when someone's in an Adam Sandler flick... It's pretty much going to be an Adam Sandler flick. It's going to be ridiculous. It's going to be absurd. You're probably going to make fart jokes. I just don't understand wh why in Al Pacino's mind he thinks it damaged his career. Because I'm just like, I mean, did you see yourself in The Devil's Advocate? Honestly, because people make people kind of make fun of Al Pacino mm -hmm. starting in the early aughts. 
you know, of his overacting and the, ah, oh, you know, it's, it's Al Pacino. Literally, my friends at Switchfoot referenced <laughs> Al Pacino in one of their songs and talked about how Al Pacino's cash, nothing lasts in this life, baby. Cody's got a lot of celebrity friends. You are at the top. All the friends. All yeah, the friends. John Foreman and I. He I mean, pointed at me once. All, all you got to do is look at like the cast of that movie, and you're like, is a single other person of high like celebrity stature saying this? This is like if like Henry Winkler came out and said like Adam Sandler ruined my career. It's like what what are you even talking about? Yeah, it's well, like you said, it's just a goofy movie. It's you're doing silly stuff. It's, let's let's see who else was in this movie. Tons of celebrities. Katie Holmes. Katie Holmes kind of removed herself from the uh, movie industry because she's a very successful uh, fashion person in the mm. fashion world, right? Alan Covert was, of course, in it because he's in most but Adam Sandler things. Mm -hmm. David Spade. Hey, friend hey. of the pod. Johnny Depp. His career might be in The Pooper, but it's not because of this movie. <laughs> no. No. <laughs> Dana Carvey was in this movie. Mm -hmm. Nick Swartzen. I love Nick Swartzen. Shaquille O'Neal. Yeah. Shaq is probably at the height of his post career, still getting work. Regis Philbin. Did this movie kill Reg? <laughs> Do we? I don't know. Norm Macdonald. I mean, there's a lot of proof here that this movie might have been cursed. Who knows? Maybe um, he's right. Norm peace, died Norm. several years after this movie. <laughs> Rest came in out. peace, Norm. Tim Meadows, Michael Irvin, Dan Patrick, Christy Brinkley, John McEnroe. Man, there are tons of people in this yeah, movie. Seriously, Billy Blanks. <laughs> <laughs> the Tybo went oh belly up God. after this movie. Oh my gosh. This movie killed Tybo. <laughs> Either Al Pacino was in on the joke of this movie or he was so unaware that this, he definitely should never have signed on. I'm going to tell you what, this might be worth a be kind rewind itself. I'm looking at this cast. Yeah. This is a. Is Dave Matthews in this? The, Dave Matthews is not, but this is a monster cast. You've yeah. got you've got people who've gone on, who've passed on here. You've got oh man, Jared Fogel, the subway guy. We can't watch it now. <laughs> <laughs> oh man. Uh, yeah, it's good. the the sham wow guy is in this. Yeah. Uh mm -mm. Yeah, there's some bad news going on mm -hmm. in this movie. They mm. were a little edgy with their casting. Maybe it is a little bit. It looked cursed. like they took everybody. And all they need is the my pillow guy. Oh yeah, we get real Whoa. crazy. Or uh, Alex Alex Jones. We're not going there. <laughs> the elites don't want you to know that the ducks in the park. You can just take them home. That's what Alex Jones would say. <laughs> <laughs> All right, it's time for the movie game. That's oh. right, the craze taking the world by storm. The movie game coming up. back it's time for the movie game this is the first official installment of the movie game all scores will be official and and be kept for posterity from here on out cody <sighs> last week did not count you have no records i you, had all the records you're starting fresh because now you have an opponent oh i'm nervous now. okay yeah, oh, I'm oh going to explain the rules. Don't okay. worry. All right, let's go. For, for you and everyone listening at home, don't worry. The home game's coming soon. Uh, I think the home game's already out. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Rotten Tomatoes may use their own uh, movie profiles for their own game. But this is what we do. We take three Rotten Tomato movie profiles. So a movie profile and Rotten Tomatoes. We take a, a good movie, like a... A certified fresh movie, we take a mediocre movie, and we take a terrible movie, something under like 30-some percent. Okay. And then you will choose the, from the tomato score the one you want to try and solve. Ooh, okay. Okay, and then there are five levels. On the first level, you could try and uh, you'll get the year, so you'll have the tomato score and the year on level one. Level two, you'll get the second build actor. Level three, you'll get the audience score. 
Level four, you'll get the first build actor, and level five, you get the blurb. You're trying to solve it as soon as possible. Um, in the practice run, someone might have solved it on the second run. It doesn't wow. count. Once again, okay. not official. I'm adding pressure to the situation. <laughs> I'm going to say, I feel like Cody. Cody's like, yeah, I've been practicing all day. Your only <laughs> goal as a guest is to beat Cody. Capitalist Cody wants to win the game. It's your job. Competitive Cody. Competitive Cody. Yes. Okay. All right. All right. Wants to win the game. I your goal it. is to beat Cody. That's it. all you want to do. So you want to solve it as quickly as possible. So tensions in the air. I, I have it. three movie profiles from Rotten Tomatoes. Okay. One is a 26% audience score. One is a 64% audience score. And one is a 96% audience score. Now, there's oh, some wow. strategy here because yeah. it depends on, like, do I know good movies? Do I know bad movies? Do I know medium range movies? Which one would you like to try and solve, Justin? I'm going to go for the 64. He's going for the middle one. That's I'm, an interesting I'm, strategy. I'm going to go mid. All right, Justin, here is your level one clue. 64% tomato score. We already told you that in 2003. So a mediocre movie from 2003. Do you have a guess? I do. I don't think it's right, but I have a guess. All right. Hit me with it. The Life of Pi. That's a good guess. I think that's a fine guess. It's not correct. Level two, you're going to get the second build actor. So it's a 64% okay. movie in 2003. And the second build actor, Laura Linney. Co Ooh. Cody just got really excited. Oh, Cody thinks he knows it. He's, he's struggling. So, so I make another guess. Yeah. You can or okay. we can move on. Let's move on. I don't think Laura Linney helps me. Level three, probably not going to help you much. Okay. This is the okay. one that's probably the weakest. The audience score goes up a little bit, 72%. So it's remembered uh -huh. a little bit better than it was, than it was critically received okay. when it first came out. Okay. Oh, nice. So the audience score goes up 2003, 64% tomato score, Laura Linney. But the audience says, which the audience score can keep changing. Yeah. The audience says 72%, which would be almost fresh. Can I... Can I make a guess? You yes. can. Spanglish? It is not Spanglish. Not Spanglish. So we're moving on to level four. Okay, you're now going to get level four, the first build actor. Okay, This one you go. might do it for you. First build actor, Hugh Grant. Oh. Hugh Grant. So you got uh, Hugh Grant and Laura Linney. Oh, he's, he's on, really close, I think. Uh, he knows that he just can't come up with the name right now. People are screaming into their, their headphones right now. Oh, God. I don't think the, risk it for the biscuit. Yeah. 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 Hugh Grant, Laura Linney came out in 2003, 64% rotten tomato score. Is there 72% audience score? Justin stumped. Dang it. Is, is there a movie called Mickey Blue Eyes? There is, but it's not that. Good guess. Good guess. <sighs> Level five. This one is the one that probably will do it. Here is the blurb. The stories of several Londoners looking for love intersect in this feel-good romantic comedy set at Christmas. A beloved holiday film. Oh, my Hugh Grant, land. Laura Linney, 64% Rotten Tomato score. Oh, my goodness. Justin is stumped. Liam Neeson's in it. Liam oh Neeson. Gosh. Yeah. Colin Firth. I, I feel so bad. I know people are just screaming. Kira on the Knightley other is yeah. in this. Tons which of people. I <sighs> might have put her over Laura Linney. The guy from The Walking Dead <laughs> is in this movie. The movie um, Notting oh. Hill. No, it is oh. not Notting Hill. I am not just a girl standing in front of a guy oh. telling you that you I, failed. Uh, <laughs> wake up with Flim in the morning. <laughs> So the pressure is off Cody. Um, All he has to do is solve <laughs> this movie. Dude, like, um, I, I hope you get a romance movie you've never seen before in your life. <laughs> Will it be the 26% Rotten Tomato movie or the 96%? You know what? I feel bad for Justin. I got jobbed. So I'll go 26%. Wow. We might, we might have two failures. We might. We might have um, two failures. Feel so bad I'll, I'll hold this last one as a tiebreaker. Cody, you picked... The movie with a 26% Rotten Tomato score, truly rotten, year 1992. Ooh. Yeah. You were, you were a you wee were, lad. You were three. I was three. Yeah. Wee lad. So do you have a guess with the 60 or 26% 1992 movie? Tommy Knockers. It is not Tommy Knockers. <laughs> uh, level two, the second build actor, Martin Short. Out of the Martys. Short is my least 
<laughs> Known <laughs> quantity. For kicks and giggles, the Santa Claus 3, yeah. even though that's not 92. <laughs> yeah, way too early for that. Way too early. Level 3, the audience score, 52% doubles the Rotten Tomatoes. Score. Ew. So this was a movie that people liked, but the critics didn't. People half liked. Yeah, I got nothing right now. Okay, this is the one. This is the one where it might he might get you, Justin. Level oh, four, okay. he gets the first build actor now. Oh. And he adds to the information we've already given him now, Kurt Russell. Oh, shoot. Ah! Oh, this is... <laughs> I don't think this one's very easy. It's not. For oh. someone who did not live through the 80s. <laughs> I lived yeah. through the 80s. Oh. Kind of. And I feel like Jackson loves this movie. Jackson probably is yelling at you th through his listening device right as we speak. I'm not going to slander Kurt Russell. Go on to the next one. Level five. It's, it all comes down to the blurb or we're going to a tiebreaker. A neurotic landlubber inherits a yacht and hires a charming but irresponsible captain to sail the boat and his family to Miami. Oh, this isn't overboard. Oh, Dang he it. doesn't know. <laughs> oh, my God. So we are going to a tiebreaker if Cody cannot get this right on so our very first official game. I actually know I have seen this, but I know I don't know the title of it. Oh, the this. movie is Captain Ron. A son of a gun, Captain Ron. We go to the tiebreaker. The thing is, is I reference Captain Ron. Here's the way the tiebreaker will uh -huh. work. We will go through this quickly as I can read oh, them, boy. not super quick. The first person to raise his hand by my sight will get to guess. Okay? Are you ready? Uh-huh. Level one, you will get the tomato score in the year. It is 96% in 1990. 96%, 1990. Level two, you will get the second build actor. It is Ray Liotta. Level uh, three, the audience score, 97%. Oh so very gosh. consistent. Critics loved it. Uh, Audiences loved it. Oh, oh, oh. 1990, second build actor, Ray Liotta. Level four, oh the gosh. first build actor is Robert De Niro. You guys are awful at this game. I know, hey. I know. Level five, the blurb. A young boy in Brooklyn, enamored with the mafia lifestyle, Joe joins Pesci's the mob and works his way up the ranks, experiencing a life full of excess, violence, uh, addiction, it's and a betrayal. It's Scorsese movie. I award Dude, you no I, points, and may wait, God wait, have wait, mercy wait, on uh, both of your souls. Um, this is a uh, pop culture I show. I know. What uh, is happening uh, right well, now? Because you're putting too much pressure. They don't, uh, they don't respond well to pressure. Apparently. I know. They, no. The Unmentionables? The Unmentionables? Yeah. I don't think that's a. I don't think that's a movie. <laughs> I think the it unmentionables could be. are my underwear. <laughs> you it mean the be. untouchables? Oh, you guys! I the, mean, I, I see it in my head. I don't the know movie what it's is called. Goodfellas. Yes, yeah. oh, Goodfellas. That was a disastrous round of the movie game. Um, I honestly think that we should. I don't replay this and not do those movies. I don't. Man, that was that was, <laughs> that was brutal. I'm just gonna throw it out there. That, Would you like to play again? Yes, because that was a waste of time and yeah, a I think, segment. I think we goofed You don't that want that. All right. Goof that up. Okay. We're going to give the game another try because there was such frustration. You really couldn't, you really couldn't see the frustration in the, world, the room. I could see the frustration. But we're going to give them another shot. I have grabbed three more cards, a bad movie, a mediocre movie, and a good movie. We will be using the Rotten Tomatoes profile. You guys know the rule. We just heard. Them. Justin, you are the guest, so you will lead. I will note and remind you that your strategy last time did not work. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if anyone's did. The three <laughs> profiles of movies from Rotten Tomatoes have critical scores on Rotten Tomatoes of 34%, 60%, and 80%. Which would you like to try and solve? I'm going to go with 80%. Okay, he's going to go with the good one. 80%. <laughs> Here we go. Level one, the 80% Rotten Tomato score joined with the year it came out, 1987. Okay. That was one year after I was born. 1987. No okay. excuses. Okay. <laughs> no excuses, please. Just, just facts. Just 1987, facts. 80%. We'll move a little bit quicker here. Do you have a guess? I don't. No. Okay. We'll move on. The second build actor in this 1987 movie with the 80% Rotten Tomato score is Danny Glover. Um, you got this. Danny Glover. 
Lethal Weapon. It is Lethal Weapon. Let's go. So Justin, in his second go round, has solved on level two. Cody also had solved it. Nope, doesn't count. Hey, I'm, I'm glad you had it too, though, because that means you and I already did better than last time. Yes. That's Cody, already. <laughs> Cody did write the correct answer on the notepad. Okay. Wait, Cody, no. your movies, 34% and 60%. So you've got a somewhat bad one and a mediocre one. Which would you like to try Let's and Let's go mediocre. He's going to go mediocre. I'll save the other one just in case we need a tiebreaker. No, we probably don't. 60%. The year is 2005. Oh. 60% in 2005. Um, Does Cody have an answer to try and beat Justin and set the new record for the movie game on Pop Culture Pasture? Pirates of the Caribbean. It is not Pirates of the Caribbean. <laughs> I was like, oh, no, it is. <laughs> 60% on Rotten Tomatoes. Critic score 2005. The second build actor on level two to tie Justin is Angelina Jolie. What is this movie for the tie? I'm probably missing it because there's two movies in my head. Cody's talking himself out already. Uh, Justin has a guess on the notepad. Wanted. That is what Justin guessed, but that is incorrect. Yeah, that, that's what I had. We will go on, but you have officially lost the game. Level three, well, the audience I give score, up. 58%. I, yeah, I give up. Level four, Brad Pitt. Yeah, I already know what it is. I give well, up. Well, tell yeah. me what it is. It's Mr. and Mrs. Smith. I it knew is. it was between Correct. Mr. and Mrs. Smith. You got it at level four. We uh, got to keep no. the scores for posterity. Oh, yeah. uh, I knew it at level two. It was between Wanted and Mr. and Mrs. Mm. Smith. I just gave up and said, give up. Well, you didn't say it till I got oh, to level man. four. So. No, I literally said, give up. I already know. I know, but I got to put down a score. Yeah, yeah. yeah it doesn't matter. <laughs> Cody is upset. We will be back yeah. to talk about Joe Dirt, Be Kind Rewind, coming up. That was excitement. Everybody seems emotionally tired now. <laughs> Everybody, that was a highly competitive in the not the way we'd hoped <laughs> the movie game on the first go round. And then in the way we hoped in the second round. Yeah, we, we were killing it. We had an impromptu second round so that they could yeah. redeem themselves. And they did. I'd and say they did. Redeem we did. So now it's time to move on to the Be Kind Rewind, the main focus of this pod. And it is for the movie Joe Dirt. Starring one David Spade, this movie, a 9% on Rotten Tomatoes. Yeah. Nine? The movies that we were given for mm. either round, this was at least up there with the worst of those movies. Yeah. And I don't know how it is only a 9%. It's Jabronis. weird. Jabronis. We can talk yeah. about, I, I do think there's a specific reason why this movie is more beloved than its critical reception uh, that we can talk about as we go on. Let me give yep. the blurb. He's the wrong person at the wrong place at the wrong time. Joe Dirt, played by David Spade, is a janitor with a mullet hairdo, acid wash jeans, and a dream to find the parents that he lost at the Grand Canyon when he was eight. As his wandering, misguided search takes him from one misadventure to another, he finds his way to Los Angeles, where a shock jock, played by Dennis Miller, brings Joe on the radio to insult him. But as Joe's story unfolds, jeers turn to cheers, and an entire city is captivated. Released April 11th, 2001, directed by Denny Gordon, made $31 million at the box office. What was the budget? You looked up the budget, right? Uh, the budget was $17.7 million. Yeah, doubled the old budget almost. Yeah, I didn't that? think that budget was too outlandish. No, no, mm. not at all. I think any uh, movie company would take that these days. Sure. It's not based on a Saturday Night Live skit, but I would put this in the realm of Saturday Night Live movies. Yes. 
it's definitely from an alumnus of Saturday Night Live and kind of has that feel. Like yeah. it's vignettes, like it's skits that are all kind of weaved together, starring the same character. I was trying to remember why I never took the time to sit and watch this movie. Mm-hmm. This was my first time to sit and watch the movie from beginning to end. Can you believe that? That's bananas. I mean, kind of. You know, you, like you can you can just look at the cover of it and kind of go, is that worth my time? Like and- if you watched Comedy Central... Any time from when this movie's released to probably like 2015, it's on like every other day. <laughs> so like you'd have to avoid Comedy Central. <laughs> but you're in high school? Where, where are you at in 2001? Oh, I'm in middle school. Oh, okay. So, so yeah, you have summers off. I'm never in a position where I'm watching TV during that. I'm 25 years old when this movie comes out. And I'm going to tell you why. I think I actually, I sat down and thought about this thing because I honestly couldn't remember. Because I liked Adam Sandler. I like David Spade. I like his movies. Here's what I think it had to do with. Everything had to do with Chris Farley. Mm. That is the celebrity death that I would say shook me the most in my life at that time. Because I loved Chris Farley. And I think it shook me more than I thought originally. Because here's the deal. I really like David Spade. I enjoyed his stuff on SNL. I liked his skits. I love Tommy Boy and even Black Sheep. I know some yeah. people didn't like Black Sheep. I love Black Sheep. And I think I didn't sit and watch this when it came out because it hurt. Okay. I didn't want to watch David Spade without Chris Farley. So you go. didn't watch Just Shoot Me or whatever nope. his series was. Which he was apparently very successful on that show. Yeah, He was like the funny comic. He was kind of like the... The Neil Patrick Harris, you know, for How I Met Your Mother, to that show, Just Shoot Me, before How I Met Your Mother. Yeah. I think I just felt like we should have had all these Farley and Spade movies. Like, they should have been the next Abbott and Costello. Mm -hmm. Like, I think we should have had all these movies, and it just hurt that we lost them, and brokenness denied us of that, and it just hurt, and that's why maybe I didn't see this movie. And then you did not support uh, Chris Farley's brother, who is in this movie. I mean, how, how do I not support him? By not watching this. <laughs> okay. No, no He's disrespect. In this movie. You got to watch it for him. Yeah. So I think that's why I never watched it. But sitting down and watched it, I, I, you know, not to spoil anything, but I enjoyed it. I enjoyed my time with David Spade. David Spade doesn't get to be. He's not the home of sarcasm in this movie like he's normal characters he gets to play. I was going to say this is like stretching his range. Yeah. Because otherwise it is I am sarcastic and jaded guy. Yeah. Every movie. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And that actually gets to be Dennis Miller with his special brand of sarcasm. But his is a little bit more witty, referential. I think that they did dumb him down a little bit in this movie because he didn't go too over the top with random references. Although, like, there was an Andromeda strand like reference. Yeah. I've got a list of his references that I will give, go through at a later point because that's Dennis Miller's kind of thing. It is. And so, but yeah, so you're right. Yeah, uh, David Spade gets to do something a little different with this role, and it was fun. I had fun watching this movie. Do you guys have any broad takes about the movie you, you want to talk about before we move on? Loosely based on my real life story. <laughs> Pretty much everyone in Kansas. <laughs> real, like, so you had a mullet, huh? That, <laughs> I, I feel like that was the main difference. The main di- <laughs> I was going to say, like, the main similarity. <laughs> I, there are certain times in this movie where I thought, oh, I'm in Kansas. One of those times was when he actually finds his parents. Yeah. I'm yep. like, oh, yeah, these are Kansans. And the other time was the carnival. The which, carnival yes. was spot on. Around oh, here, yeah. we call that the dirt carnival. <laughs> when the carnival shows up and sets up shop in a parking lot in your town or like out in some field, it's called the dirt carnival around these parts. That was straight up Kansas. So I will tell you, this is a true story. I did not grow up in a house that listened to modern pop or rock or hip hop. So it was a lot of oldies and a lot of country. I had never listened to a kid rock song before this movie. And so this movie paints the portrait of how I will perceive kid rock to this (laughs) very day. This movie's not far off. He's pretty much playing himself, bro. Exactly. (laughs) 
<laughs> what you don't know exactly. is evidently Kid Rock grew up with the moolah. No. He oh. just portrays poor redneck type, but he is not that and has never really been that. No way. That is scandalous. That is. That is that is scandalous. I'm, I am shocked. I'm going to have to look that up after Detroit we get done boy. recording. We sure. might have to have a whole episode, a Legends episode on Kid Rock. I will be <laughs> bashing left and right. I need that background story. Yeah. And if that's true, he is a legend. That's he wild. He pulled one over on all of us. Yeah. Eminem's really was really poor. He really was. Yeah, like actually. Yeah. Kid Rock's <laughs> out there. How come Eminem doesn't uh, say anything? Because uh, <laughs> Kid Rock and Eminem are not in the same stratosphere. But they know each other. I just figured Eminem would make fun of them. Slim Shady, you know? Not worth his time. All right. Totally. Let's go to what holds up. We'll let Justin start. What holds up in this movie for you, Justin? I think what holds up the most is that we currently live in this world where everything is very touchy, very emotional, worried about each other's feelings. Joe Dirt has the comedy that we're still looking for from like back in the day where it's like you poked fun at each other, you made fun of things. No one got offended. It was just funny. And like that's where it hits. Like you, there's parts where you just laugh out loud and it's like uh, it, it's fine. It's just old school comedy. It's the SNL wonderful skit like situations that we've all come into love and some of that stuff couldn't be done now you know it, it some of those things hold on because that's that's what we really love and i think david spade's weird performance just works yeah i, I mean he as the kind of the butt of a lot of the jokes yeah is charming and it doesn't get to his character where it kind of softens the blow because mm -hmm. like look if they tried to put this exact movie out today first of all it would get reviled for the bullying yeah like there's a lot of bullying in this movie almost instantly <laughs> but yeah i i think the movie does a really it's really weird to say this because this they set out to make a dumb comedy i'm sure mm -hmm. but then there's some smart choices in here where this movie they're not saying bullying's okay there's a commentary running through this movie, and it's that bullying's not awesome. So I think that is common within the Happy Madison flicks. Mm, yeah. That the bullies, the quote-unquote cool kids, they're really jabronis. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> and But I, this one does it a little bit more subtly, and I, I think that it, it mm. works great. Yeah. Cody, what holds up for you? Well, you know me, Dave, kid of the 80s. Um, yes, I'm aware. <laughs> <laughs> the music. Oh, the music's phenomenal. Yeah. So I told you I had not listened to Kid Rock. But as soon as Eddie Money comes on, oh, I'm man. belting it oh, out. Yeah. Uh, so It's always good to hear and see Eddie Money. Yes. Yeah. You see, he makes an appearance. He does. And so... <laughs> I love the music in this. The music's great. It goes, especially with the cars. But then there's a little piece of random trivia that ties back to music and to this movie. The alligator ranch owner. Mm -hmm. yeah, uh, Rosanna Arquette. Rosanna Arquette. Yeah, the oldest Arquette sibling um, of, of actors. Allegedly. Toto's hit song, Rosanna, is about... Miss Arquette. And as a kid, the 80s, I, of course, I knew that. Song. Yeah. I bet you didn't know that song was about her, Rosanna. That song. Yep. Uh, yeah, yeah. That's the one. I didn't know that. You're welcome. Thanks, Cody. Interesting. Toto's an interesting band. They are. Yeah. They have a lot of cool yeah. stories around their music. And uh, the guy that wrote the music for Toto wrote Human Nature by Michael Jackson. That's another Whoa. one of those interesting stories. Mm. And how Michael Jackson came to record it has to do with the, the writer's kids. Asking questions. Oh, wow. Yeah. So, yeah, that's good stuff. Nice. I like it. The cars in this movie kind of gave me some nostalgia, a little background. Yeah. My dad loves muscle cars from that era, and he loved Mopar. It's <laughs> a certain brand of cars and engines, Hemis, Dodges, Plymouths, Chryslers. Chrysler. Yeah. And so when he's driving around this 1969 Dodge Daytona slash Plymouth Roadrunner is the Ooh. another name it went by because they would make the same car sometime, but it would go by different names, even though they were all under the same umbrella. 
uh, the wing on the back. Only 503 were built. Did you know that? <laughs> and we hit the wing right off. In fact, the exact car that he drives around with the wing that looks terrible, it's in terrible shape, recently auctioned in the last month for $330,000 as is wow. with the different colored fender, <laughs> the different colored wing. Yeah, it, it's crazy. But those cars are are super rare. And it was really cool to see them. And it was really cool to kind of go back to that age where this movie's made in 2001. But this is clearly an 80s guy. D- they don't ever say it, but it seems like this movie's taken place in the 80s. I'm just saying as an 80s kid. It it hit home. Yeah, it did. Took Cody right back to that month. (laughs) Justin, what holds up? Uh, Something else that holds up is I think the uh, the Xander Kelly radio show. It feels like the majority of this movie is tied together through the fact that like we as a society long for this drama. Like his life was drama. And people just wanted to hear one more crazy thing that he did. And it's like, I feel like that's just society as a whole. We are just like chomping at the bit to hear something weird, man. Like, it's just how it, it's just how it worked. What about the nostalgia of radio shows altogether? Like morning shows. Mm -hmm. You remember morning radio shows? Did you ever listen to a morning radio show as you're in your lifetime in the eighties? Probably, but I definitely (laughs) remember them in the nineties. Like in the Kansas city area, there was a guy named Johnny Dare who was on the rock station of Johnny Dare in the mornings. And the, he was a shock jock. They could go over the line sometimes, but they were funny. And you felt like it was a family. Like there was all these cast of characters in a morning show. They always had the sidekick who was usually a female. Yeah. Like I, it, it was just a strange setup, but that this kind of takes me back to that. Uh, I miss radio like yeah. that. You can tell Dennis Miller was ready to go all in at first. Mm-hmm. And then the, the story is playing out, and he's like, okay, this is going to get ratings. I can't completely bash him yet. Yeah. According to Dennis Miller, he never watched this movie. In an interview, he said, someone told me there's a scene where fecal matter falls from the sky, and this movie not be his type of movie to watch, but gives him cachet with his kids' friends, which just sounds like something Dennis Miller would say. <laughs> that is so Dennis. <laughs> <laughs> but he's great in this movie. I remember him on Monday Night Football. Like it that. seemed like a Monday night football. He didn't have a leash on him, right? No, he just went out there. Like he would reference like the war of the roses. Dennis, these are football fans, my man. <laughs> but in this movie, I'll give you some of his list, a few of his references. Other than you dig looking like Jane Fonda in Clute. <laughs> <laughs> Quote, you're standing there with an atom bomb. Could be fat man. Could be little boy. We'll nail that down later. <laughs> Last night I went home and rented the Andromeda strain just so I could simulate immersion into that bacteriologically unsound world you call your day-to-day life. Yes. <laughs> that one was amazing. Wow. Dennis Miller was at the top of his game here. Yeah. He's reined in just a bit, like you said. Yeah. Uh, but I thought it was great. What else is good, Cody? Uh, I was going to say the supporting cast. So you have Dennis Miller. You have Christopher Walken. There's so many cameos. Jamie yeah. Presley's in this. Adam Beach. I already mentioned Chris Farley's brother, Kevin's in it. Fred Ward as his dad. <laughs> yes. I'm like, <laughs> you nailed it, buddy. Oh, absolutely Wh- nailed it. Which he's, he wasn't in enough stuff for me i feel like because the next movie i think of is sweet home alabama when he's the dad to yeah. reese witherspoon <laughs> he ends his career kind of playing these weird small bit roles as a like a grumpy dad basically in these yep. comedy movies he's yeah. in a road trip mm-hmm. as the dad of like the nerdy character who he's barely in it. that movie by the way does not hold up <laughs> that, nope. is, that is not a movie we will be doing on Be Kind Rewind, but I remember him in that movie. Um, you mentioned Adam Beach, one of our great indigenous actors. Yes. Kick and wing. He was not Kick and wing. he was not Adam Beach yet when this movie comes out. He was on a show called Smoke Signals, and they actually wanted to hire the other guy from this <laughs> show, Smoke Signals. And I, I read a story where the, the producer of Smoke Signals talked about that, and I was like, 
Oh, man. They hired the wrong guy. They don't all look the same. Come on, man. <laughs> That's racist, bro. They don't all it look is. The same. <laughs> but Adam Beach came in and played the part because it was a play on the other character in that show. And so he played the opposite character. <laughs> Anyways, there's a couple more you didn't mention. Carson Daly's one. Yeah, good cameo there. Oh, yeah. A couple character actors that I want to mention. Kathleen Freeman. Uh, she was the head nun from the Blues Brothers. Yep. Uh, uh, he, she appears as one of Joe's foster parents. Joe Don <laughs> Baker as the girlfriend's dad, the drunk guy who <laughs> yeah. shoots the dog. Shoots Charlie. He's amazing. He is uh, <laughs> Richard Ryle. I don't know. I, I think that's how you say his name. He was in Grounded for Life. He was oh, the yeah, dad yeah. to Sean. He's the cranky old guy and also is in Office Space. He's the guy that's like, oh, there were 73 of these cars sold in Louisiana that year. The cast is really kind of amazing. And then Buffalo yeah. Bob. Oh, gosh. <laughs> Brian Thompson. <laughs> you know, the whole time of that scene, I'm like, why are we here? There's some of the vignettes. I'm halfway through them. I'm like, I don't know why this is in the movie. So, yeah. Yeah. And then you, by the end of it, you're like, okay. <laughs> I'm not going to lie. It was during this one that I'm like, this is basically Forrest Gump, but the exact opposite. He's in the wrong place at the absolute <laughs> wrong time. And he's not helpful at all. They're both yeah. white trash. Yeah. Yes. And yet, yeah. you're right. It's opposite. Forrest was always in the right place at the right time. Doing the right thing. Yeah. I'll save you, <laughs> Lieutenant Dan. Yeah, it's, it's definitely a version, just a little opposite. Another thing that was good, the music choices uh, have already been mentioned, of course, are on point. This seems to be a big right reason why this movie would endear itself to people of a certain age. For instance, I smiled so big <laughs> when I'm with you by Sheriff played as brandy <laughs> rides up on the horse just perfection yeah <laughs> just an absolute perfection moment uh kid rock i'm not sure if i enjoyed seeing kid rock or not so i'm unsure whether he holds up or doesn't hold up i didn't know where mm -hmm. to put that i just put it on what holds up yeah you already mentioned eddie money yes i still enjoyed it even though it was my third favorite eddie money song but <laughs> here we are i the music's great music's yeah, great it, it is justin what else holds up I think you're right on that Brandy scene when she's riding up. Dude, it literally stops like every single person in their tracks. This is a weird place in history and time. So like there's these magazines that come out, Maxim magazine, yeah. that are literally, they're sort of like people magazine, but for frat boys. Mm -hmm. Yes. And Brittany Daniel and her twin sister, sister. are kind of somewhat big in this time for modeling in these and magazines, but they started off as the twins in the Sweet Valley High yep. TV show. Yeah. I'm not going to lie. I get them confused every time. Yeah. They actually... One of them's married to Cole Hauser, and it's the other one. And I saw them in something not too long ago because I'm like, oh, that's the lady from Joe Dirt. And then I was like, oh, nope, nope that was her <laughs> sister. Did you guys mention uh, that, that Eric Per Sullivan, the one that plays young Joe Dirt, and he's also in Malcolm in the Middle as the oh, youngest kid? that's where I saw that kid before. Okay, so, like, I don't know what it is, but his acting is, like, perfect for a little weird Joe Dirt. Like, <laughs> he makes me laugh almost more than anything else. Like, just the random situations he's put in. I laughed out loud when Britney's dad shows back up, Joe Don Baker, with his leg amputated on the same day of the accident, <laughs> and then shoots the dog. Yeah. Say goodbye, Charlie. Like, he literally <laughs> lost his leg today, and he gets up out of a cab with the crutches <laughs> and a shotgun. Like, what? That made me laugh out loud. The, uh, the floating molar scene. Oh, that yes. was great. So there's a mooning that happens? Yes, it in the plane. It seems like that used to happen a lot in the 80s. That was a thing, mooning. In fact, mm -hmm. it was in movies a lot. Yeah. Usually college kids or high school kids would do a lot of mooning in movies back in the 70s and 80s. <laughs> and, and mooning went away. Indecent exposure yes. in plumbers. I mean, it's probably a good thing yeah. that it did. I'm just wondering what happened. So I do feel like the way he talks about the town that Brandy lives in, is how, like, every Midwesterner talks about their hometown if they like it. Dude, I want to live in Silvertown. <laughs> and I'm like... Silvertown. I've heard people describe Chanute, which is where we're recording, that way. I'm like, 
Did you no. live here? No, Silvertown's way cooler. <laughs> you all are missing the real picture. No, I feel that that was accurate, especially for back then, that people were like, oh, yeah, this town was just amazing. It had everything. Mm. People would be friendly and smile at you and shake your hand and mm -hmm. all that jazz. The Ode to Firecrackers in this movie. I, it's it's nearly, if it's not the top scene, it's pretty close. This it's, this Great. podcast coming out Fourth uh, of July week is not an accident. Yeah, because you remember firecrackers in particular. The quote that's on the shirt Cody is wearing right now: "Who's for do's and who's for don'ts." You're going to tell me you don't have no black cats, no Roman candles, or screaming memes? Come on, man! You don't got no lady fingers, buzz bottles, snicker bombs, church burners, finger blasters, gut busters, zippity doodahs, or crap flappers. You're going to stand there owning a fireworks stand and tell me you don't have no whistling bungholes, no spleen splitters, whisker biscuits, husker doos, husker don'ts, cherry bombs, tipsy dozers, with or without the scooter stick, or one single whistling kitty chaser? <laughs> That's amazing. No. That is an amazing soliloquy. Um, what do you have? So I <laughs> sparklers, man. Snakes and sparklers. I did. Because they're the only ones I like. Completely forget. The scene where the atom bomb goes yeah. off <laughs> and kicking <and> wing <laughs> melts away. <laughs> that was great. Laughed out loud. The whole atom bomb <laughs> gag was so stinking hilarious, including the where he's like, he's tied up to it. And he's yeah. like, oh, man, we're going to get so busted. I think we all said that in high school in Kansas yeah. at some point. Oh, man, you we're going to get it. so busted. And then, of course, you know, the poop gag. There's yeah. got to be a poop gag. Like, literally, though, like, that scene is made by how David Spade says those things, though. Because, like, you know, they, it explodes. He's like, oh, man, we're going we're gonna to so dead. Let's get out of here. And then he looks over and he, like, melts away. And he's like, ah. And then he, he like, wakes up and he's like, ah. And he's like, oh, man, that thing's an atom bomb. He's like, I I'm going to hit it. It goes bang. You know, like, he's just saying weird stuff. And it's like, it's funny because Spade's saying it. Like, yeah. He cries, I got the poo on me. We got to, we forgot to mention Christopher Walken, who He's appears great. in this movie and actually other Sandler movies, by the way. Mm -hmm. Also, this is a 9% Rotten Tomato score, and somehow it didn't damage his career, Al Pacino. It did Lo not. And behold, um, you're talking to my guy all wrong. It's yeah. Wrong tone. He's fine in it. He's great. <laughs> He's Christopher Walken. <laughs> oh, <laughs> he is phenomenal in this. His line delivery is perfect. It always is. He, exquisite line yeah. delivery. I'm literally excited for Severance season two. Who among us hasn't fallen for the Tilt-A-Whirl operator at the Dirt <laughs> Carnival? I'm pretty sure the last time the Dirt Carnival came here, the Tilt-A-Whirl operator had a hook for a hand. Oh, gosh. I'm just saying um, that ends the list of Easy what I have pull the switch. that holds up. What doesn't hold up? Justin, what doesn't hold up? I feel like I've kind of said it. Like It's kind of like some of the things that were good. You know, Some of the goofy themes, some of the comedy these days – wouldn't hold up like yeah. it would never fly yeah it's funny the bullying we mentioned it already it doesn't it made me cringe at times even though i think it redeems that storyline by saying clearly the movie is bringing you in a direction where like hey yeah this is wrong but the bullying was oh, it was rough at times so in the movie, there's a gag where they use someone's name as a synonym for going number two. Mm -hmm. And in junior high and high school, I'm ashamed to say we did that. So, Todd, if you're listening, sorry about that. Oh. Uh, it wasn't nice of us to use your name as a synonym for going number two. It was not. I will say I do quote Kid Rock in this when he's like, uh, go run home. Let's go get some french fries with that wham burger yeah. <laughs> like i'm all about that say <laughs> get you a wineken cody is this where you want to be when jesus comes back <laughs> making fun of poor joe dirt <laughs> but i did feel bad for him when he's the janitor working in schools i do see like kids making fun of people that work there especially like the kitchen staff or the custodial crew and it's like come on people they, A, are preventing you from getting some weird disease because schools are just germ heaven. And also, they're nice people. They are making money. There's no need to be little. I will say the language that the bullies use in this movie definitely doesn't hold up. 
even when you know they're supposed to be bullying, uh, they're supposed to be bullies. They're not admirable characters. Some of particularly the words they use, the language wouldn't hold up today, even if the audience knew that they were supposed to not be good people. But it does capture the kind of the essence of the 80s and 90s in that way. And even the aughts, it, we don't wipe out certain words as common in the lexicon of the culture that were very derogatory. We don't wipe that out till the t- tins. The one that made me cringe in the movie was a uh, slang word for someone who has a learning disability. Yes. That one in particular was, I was like, oh man, yeah, that doesn't hold up. That was rough. I will piggyback off that in one of my favorite scenes. It gets censored whenever you watch it on Comedy Central, and it's the home is where you make it scene. <laughs> I, I love that scene. I <laughs> love so it. Funny. But it gets censored, and clearly it does offend some people, even though like it's not used in a derogatory way. He's just trying to find out what the guy's actually saying. Yeah. yeah. And... Even if you do like to watch people naked, <laughs> that is, I don't know if that is necessarily a horrible thing, but clearly times have changed and this movie would not necessarily make it through. Yeah. It's funny because Joe Dirt is not judging. No. Yes. In that, he's in just that trying scene. to figure it out. <laughs> he's just trying to figure out what he's saying and he's getting it wrong because that character also a cameo. From another Adam Sandler movie, The Waterboy, uh, it's billed as the same character who's yeah. speaking very, very deep South Louisiana. And maybe it offends Cajun people, and so they <laughs> censor it. I don't know. That could be. It would be a really interesting to get Jason Geesman's, uh, Geek of the Round Table, Jason Geesman's opinion on this, because he does ministry work with foster kids. And there's a deep underlying kind of theme in this movie of love for foster kids Mm -hmm. and that's kind of the theme of the movie and that a lot of the foster parents are weird and (laughs) wacky and whacked out and not great people at times Uh, but you're meant to feel again joe dirt gets made fun of the comedy is is about making fun of joe dirt most of the time and yet the movie succeeds in making you feel empathy and sympathy for joe you're Mm -hmm. on his side Justin, what else doesn't hold up? So there's there's a scene that kind of makes me cringe a little bit, and like like I think even today when I was watching a few clips, I was like, ah, let's let's just move past that. And uh, you know he's he's done with the tilt to whirl and everything like that. And there's uh, <laughs> yes, clearly like some uh, you know sexual tension between him and the girl. And uh, Jamie Presley is the actress yes. there, who is another Didn't- one of those weird. Famous for being hot. Yes. Girls. Yeah, there you go. Yeah. She, she was an actress, but yeah, she was in a lot of things, but usually smaller roles and was propped up as yeah. the yeah. attractive love potential interest. Yeah, again, yeah. I, I'm going to call it the Maxim generation. Yes. There was just these, there was these women who were just extremely famous for being attractive. That scene yeah. was rough. Because I felt that too. So for me, I felt that played on stereotypes of certain regions. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And for sure. so like I still chuckled at it. Ew, no, no, it was funny. <laughs> so, I'm not saying it wasn't it, funny. And I didn't cringe. I was like, it ah, feels it feels kinda. very David Spade. I feel like that's exactly what David Spade probably does to people. And he's like, <laughs> I'm just kidding. Nah, 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 nah. It's weird that this movie is a David Spade Spade movie because mm-hmm. Here's this usually smarmy, clever, witty, kind of well-to-do guy who's sticking up. Like, this whole movie, he's sticking up for the Midwesterner white trash guy. Again, David Spade with his full range on display. (laughs) Yeah. What else doesn't hold up, Cody? There are certain aspects of this movie where I think they plug in things to move the plot, but then we don't address it. And so then you're left wondering, well... Where's Joe Dirt's sister? That's a good point. Where is Joe Dirt's sister? Because <laughs> Joe Dirt's sister is the thing that brings up his name being different. Like, our last name's this, and your last name's Dirt. There might be something there. And also... You, you want to hear a theory? Okay. My theory is 
that Jamie Presley was was actually playing Joe Dirt's sister, and he actually did spend some time with her. And they, when they aired the previews, you know how they do the mm-hmm. test movies. The audiences yeah. didn't like it; they cringed. They were not, and they okay. probably rewrote it and wrote her mostly out of the movie. I am choosing to believe that my dear friends David Spade and Adam Sandler are above <laughs> altering at the behest of the audience and right. the critics. That one might require further study. Kids, don't use gasoline to enhance your firecrackers. <laughs> don't. This 4th of July, don't do that. Uh, did we ever, as a people, really like poo jokes? Do we really need to see fake poo falling on David Spade's head? Yes. <laughs> I mean, how much? How I much like, was in I there? I like the, res, the resolve there, Cody. <laughs> how much was in there? I felt immense anger at Kid Rock when his character said Def Leppard sucks. Mm. I LOL'd. How dare you, Kid Rock? <laughs> um, so I do have a question for you, since you brought that up. Mm-hmm. When he's Joe Dirt starts meeting with Dennis Miller, and he's talking about like how macho and how cool he is. He brings up that he is a Van Halen fan yeah. and not not none of Van that Hagar. Van Hagar. Stuff. I'm a rocker. Yeah. Here's my favorite rocker band: through and through, ACDC, man. Skinner, Van Halen, not Van Hagar. Hagar. <laughs> yeah, he. Well, okay, that fits. That was actually a very '80s kind of response to that, and there was a sense of back then when that was going on. That real rock heads would have said that they would have been like, no, not a fan of Van Van Halen with Sammy Hagar at it. Mm. It was they, they they definitely had a more agreeable sound, I'd say, a poppier sound. Um, although it was very good. I mean, I think music wise, I don't think there's a comparison. I just think it was so much better with Sammy Hagar. Not that it was bad with David Lee Roth. It was just different. Gambling. Um, and so I felt vindicated. For a few weeks ago on the podcast when we were asked in the lobby. Well, Cody is more of a rocker than me. I am. (laughs) Um, Deeper themes. What deeper themes are present here? I definitely think that you get the theme of what real family is. Mm -hmm. Mm, Yeah. Every time I watch this movie, I'm always upset with Brandy because she lies not once but twice and the first time, it was understandable, it, and it was read off from a note that Kid Rock's reading. But then, like, telling him that, oh, your parents are dead, instead of, let's have a phone conversation where I tell you about them, instead of talking about it on TRL. Yeah, the big problem with Happy Madison movies, Adam Sandler movies in particular, in this movie, the lead female, usually paper thin. Yes. And this is no different. And in fact, her character is super inconsistent. I feel like the first third of the movie, the first half of the movie, she's played on level with Joe Dirt. She's unintelligent. She's kind of goofy and lost. She doesn't really get what's going on around her. And then somewhere around the halfway point after he leaves, she starts acting in a way where like, oh, okay, she's she's got some cleverness and some intelligence. And then, yeah, the lying, it implied a cognitive thinking that I didn't think they displayed she had and was out of character for her. But to get back to the deeper themes, she lets Joe Dirt know that it's not the, the your parents aren't your only family. Mm-hmm. We love you too, Joe. Keep being a good person. Good things will happen. That's Keep Joe Dirt on. at some point says that. Yep. And I thought. You know what? Sure. Why not? Uh, Some his, people, if you're really downtrodden, you're going to be like, no, I'm a good person. <laughs> his one liners. Life's a garden. Dig, Dig it. it. <laughs> uh, like You make it work for you. It's practical sense and honestly good mental health platitudes to be espousing that like, oh, you keep on doing the good things you're doing. Something good's bound to happen. And he, even though his life was garbage and was living in a closet, literally, he was happy with it. Yeah. He was finding purpose and meaning in his life in what some people would say is total, utter failure. On one level, this movie is a love letter to white trash. And I use that term lovingly. Right. I wish DJ was here for this because I've heard him talk about this, but I'm going to use some big words. 
the structural structural pervasiveness of class inequality. Mm. We talk about racism. We talk about um, oppression of other groups in this country, LGBT. Uh, that gets a lot of run these days. Do you know, and I've heard DJ, who of course is our friend, who is African-American, he's talked about, you know who doesn't get noticed? What a lot of people call white trash. They get forgotten. But this movie pays special attention to that kind of looking down upon. Everyone looks down on Joe Dirt. Mm -hmm. Everyone looks down, and he never has a chance because it's the way he looks, right? But isn't the way he looks just culture? You know, what do you think when you see someone with a mullet, especially if you're from a coast? Yep. Dennis Miller's comment about Billy Ray Cyrus. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> that is usually in my top two things that I think when I see someone with a mullet still today. You're correct that this movie is a letter that at least acknowledges that group of society. Yeah, this is like their movie. This is the movie for... You know, people live in mobile home parks, which yeah. I I lived in a mobile home park for a while when I was a kid. So I, I know and I get it. I understand that dynamic. And so, yeah, I, I dig this movie for that reason, that they kind of bring uh, some some awareness to some people who maybe, you know, are pretty invisible in our culture most of the time. Yeah. Any other deeper themes we want to talk about? I think it's just a longing to be loved. It's just like piggybacking mm -hmm. on you guys. It, it has to do with insecurity. It has to do with maybe even like a love language of needing words of affirmation that, mm. that never happened. Like, I think that's cool at the end when like, you know, like him and kid rock are kind of mouthing off at each other. And he's just like, who are these people, your family or something? He's like, yeah. So what if we are yeah. like, man, what do you use dad or something? He's like, yeah. So what if I am? As he's saying those things, Joe's like smiling like a little bit bigger and a little bit bigger. And he's just like, he's like, don't ever talk to him that way again. You know, it's like and they all like they'll stick up for him. And then it's even to like the extent of everything that Joe loves when he's like, you really think your lame car can beat this Hemi? Like, are you kidding me right now? And like, he's just like, oh, my gosh, I've got everything. Like, I mean, it's just this. Yeah. Overwhelming of, of joy and love that he has. The only thing that could have made this movie super countercultural it fits because Kid Rock plays a group. He's just a great guy to have as your quote unquote villain. Yeah. Uh, but if we would have saw a scene of why Kid Rock is the reason Kid <laughs> Rock is the way he is, like that his parents were probably absent. Yeah. yeah. Brokenness begets brokenness. And um, that's true. That's the thing left unsaid because Kid Rock has to be just an obvious villain in that moment. Who is your winner of the movie, Justin? I'm going to go somewhere other than Joe because I feel like Joe wins. I mean, I feel like Joe ultimately does. the character of Joe Dirt. Yeah. yeah, but I really like uh, I really like Dennis Miller as Xander Kelly. I think he plays a really vital role in making that movie just truck along. This it, might be my favorite thing Dennis Miller's in, including Saturday Night Live. Yeah, he was awful <laughs> in Saturday Night Live most of the time. Those weekend updates. I've recently gone back and started watching some of those that era of Saturday Night Live. Weekend updates with Dennis Miller were mo mostly awful. Mm -hmm. He doesn't seem to be taking them seriously. And he, he like laughs at the jokes at weird times. Like he's embarrassed to deliver them. And I would have been too. Is. And I would have yeah. been too. Cause they were awful. Uh, it uh, just was really bad. And I, I feel like, Oh man, Dennis Miller has standards. I'm sure he does. I'm <laughs> sure he does. Cody, who's the winner of the movie? Um, so Adam beach or kicking wing. Yeah. Adam hey. beach. Hey, now kicking wing animal doctor. Yeah. Let's uh, go. So honestly, I was going to say Dennis Miller. Cause like if you watched his weekend updates or you watched Monday night football with him, you're like, this dude is way too highbrow for either of these two scenes. Mm -hmm. But Adam Beach, he gets a lot of smaller roles, and every time I see him, I'm like, hey, it's Kickin' Wing. Um, <laughs> except uh, literally they have him in the Suicide Squad, the first one, not the James Gunn oh. one, and he gets killed off at like 10 seconds after you meet him. Mm. And I'm like, what the heck? You could have killed anyone else on this screen. Yeah, Adam Beach... Uh 
arrives on the scene in a show called Smoke Signals, which obviously is about Mm -hmm. indigenous folks, uh, then blows up the year after this movie comes out with Wind Talkers, with Nicolas Cage, Mm, about the Navajo uh, who served in Vietnam and broke the code. And, or was it Korea? Uh, Korea. I think, yeah, it might have been Korea. Then um, he's in the Clint Eastwood movie Flags of Our Fathers mm-hmm. and is amazing in that movie. And I, I'm, I'm not sure, but is he nominated maybe for an Oscar for that role? Potentially. Uh, he was fantastic. But he's been in Cowboys and Aliens you may have heard of. He's been in, of course, Suicide Squad. Um, he's had a long, long career uh, and has just been around and been working. And, yeah, he's awesome. Loves Madam Beach. So, yes, I feel this movie launches his career. Yeah. Because, like, if you watch this movie and you say kick and wing, mm. everyone knows who you're talking about. I could tell you what the alligator ranch owner's <laughs> name was, but no one knows. Yeah. The, uh, <laughs> and if I said Rosanna Arquette's character, people would be like, who? Rosanna was a bigger deal back in the day. But. She was. And right in this, uh, the wheelhouse of the, who this movie is playing towards. Uh, the winner of the movie for me, I'm going to go with Kid Rock. Oh, wow. <laughs> Kid Rock, <laughs> th- he couldn't have asked for a better movie role to kind of come out the gate with. Yeah. I mean, this literally not only plays to his music, his, his kind of persona, but also plays to his fans, mm. which, no offense, I liked Ball with the Ball. <laughs> I liked his, that album that blew up. I listened to it a lot. And uh, I don't know that I like Kid Rock, mm. uh, the dude. Like, you know, he's he's had some interesting events and things he said and stuff like that. I don't know if I would, like, want to hang out with this dude. But I enjoyed that album. And as I'm thinking back, this was just the perfect kind of place for him do we think kid rock is especially talented and the talent level matches how big he got because he was big or did it just kind of happen like lightning i think it's just lightning in a bottle and that's why i think he wins this movie so i will say i like more uncle cracker songs (laughs) than i do kid rock songs some of you start laughing but some Um, of you need an explanation yes uncle cracker is kid rock's dj Who goes, oh, like, on to a solo career where he makes, like, some easy listening stuff? Like, yeah, literally, that stuff's weird, man. I oh. remember hearing Uncle Cracker on Delilah. <laughs> yep. <laughs> it's so weird. Such a weird turn of events. But there uh, we go. Follow me. Uh, the Everything Do- is all right. The Dobie Gray song that he covered. Yeah. Wild. So wild. Yeah. We have to do a Legends episode on Uncle Cracker. We will, especially when you hear my loser of this movie. (laughs) That is wild. Justin, who's your loser of the movie? Uh, Charlie the dog. (laughs) (laughs) Yes. Like, I mean, I feel like you could make maybe a case for, like, nearly every character in here. Because it all just kind of feels loser-esque. But, dude, Charlie got an unfair deal, man. Charlie Mm. did. uh, Buffalo Bob the guy that played him <laughs> no. i just feel bad for him because <laughs> like he's always buffalo bob now yeah. in my mind yeah silence of the lambs was so iconic it was it was such scary, an iconic man. movie ah. i get it why you would play off buffalo bill uh but buffalo bob yeah that's that's the thing who's who's your loser of the movie Gody? kid rock kid rock you're going kid rock is the loser yes I wasn't joking. This movie literally paints how I see Kid Rock. Oh, he's playing himself. And so (laughs) to think he grew up more wealthy. Yeah. Well, right. He's playing his persona, I should say. Yeah. And his rhetoric post this movie, especially in more recent times, matches like his demeanor in this movie. And I'm like, you don't have to be a jerk face everywhere you go, bud. You can be nice. Be like Uncle Cracker. <laughs> I think we could all learn to be more like Uncle Cracker. Is it can we can we honestly say that maybe Robert James Ritchie stopped existing at this movie and just he just became Kid Rock? Maybe. And I'm like, I'm glad that 
Cheryl Crow, put your picture away, buddy. <laughs> I, for, I forget. He was married to Pamela Anderson for like a year. Yeah. It's Kid, a thing. Rock, yeah. He was living the high life. Dude, that's yeah. wild. Um, yeah, like what was that, a fever dream? Like, It kind of feels like world? it. And Cheryl Crow. I mean, he was with Cheryl Crow for Sheesh. a bit, right? I don't know if they were dating or if they just made song a song together. Okay, I don't know, maybe Cheryl Crow definitely was, was with, with Lance, Lance Armstrong. Armstrong. Yeah. And they hold the same space in my head. I feel like that's more believable though. Like all this other stuff is like, <laughs> what? Um, my loser of the movie, and I say this with much sadness, is David Spade. Oh. I feel like after Chris Farley dies, like first of all, let's acknowledge if Chris Farley doesn't die, what happens? He makes what do we say? At least 10 more movies. They make 10 more movies together and we love them. They go down as the, as an unbelievable comedy pair, a la yeah. Laurel and Hardy, a la Abbott and Costello, just like two guys you love to see together. Even like the, the grumpy old men guys, Walter Matthau and Jack Lemon. Yeah. Like we, I feel like we were denied them as old men movies. Mm. So I think that like David Spade in this movie, they would have needed Adam Sandler to throw them a bone. Maybe. Because Farley towards the end had a couple big flops. Right. But he wasn't himself. So, yeah. He was deep into his drug use. And I, I like, you know, like Beverly Hills Ninja and things like that. I don't even know how much of the real Chris Farley was left by that point. I just feel like if none of that happens, David Spade's life goes a different way. And this movie was like the movie where he tries to prove he's enough of a comic to be able to carry a movie on his own. And, of course, we know what happens. Not that this movie didn't make money, but the critical reception probably killed it. And he's never he's never the like the lead in a movie again after this. Yeah. Although, as we said on Just Shoot Me, he becomes a TV guy. And like, listen, you want to hear something crazy? Don't feel sorry for David Spade. His net worth is $70 million. Do you know his brother is the guy that started Kate Spade? I was going to say his brother was married to Kate yeah, of they, Kate Spade. They started that business Whoa. together, named it after his wife. Of course, she passed tragically away. passed away. Um, you know, so that was a sad thing. And David Spade has made some very uh, smart investments in real estate. Because I know a lot of people listening is like, wait a minute, he's worth 70 mil? Yeah, yeah, he's he's got it pretty good right and now. And, like, honestly, I think he just works because he wants to work. And he mm -hmm. takes weird projects because he's intrigued by them. So, like, when the Joe Exotic stuff was blowing up, the Tiger King, mm -hmm. he had, like, specials interviewing the Tiger King people like Joel McHale did as well. Um, and it wasn't because he was desperate for money, clearly. It was because, ah, I was intrigued by this story. It was so wild and yeah. kind of plays into Joe Dirt people, essentially. Yeah. I just think maybe the loser of the movie is me and people like me who just really, really have a place in their heart for the movies Tommy Boy and Black Sheep. I just love them two together. They were yeah. so perfect together. They were. They just they just matched up well, and uh, I feel I really wanted to see more of it. Mm. Uh, is this movie good? This will be the final question. Is this movie good? And side question: Does it have something of substance to say? Did they mean to do this? Where they had some of this really deep thing to say, or did they just set out to make a dumb movie and they kind of accidentally fell into having something to say? And is this movie actually good? Does it deserve better than nine percent on Rotten Tomatoes? It deserves better than 9%. Like, I don't really know that it's a great movie, but I think there's real, there's real, like, tones there. There's real issues. I feel like it maybe accidentally stumbles into them, but yeah. it, it really, I mean, there's clear definition of what they're trying to say there. It's, it's old school hilarity mixed with, actually, I think, some good moral value in there. It's kind of wild, but I don't know that it's great. I mean, it's probably yeah. just right on the border of, Cody. So I honestly think it should be in our middle pile of cards if we're doing the movie game. Better than 9%. 
way yeah. better than nine yeah. percent. And I've seen comedies that critics have given outstanding scores to, and it's like unwatchable. Unwatchable. I don't mm-hmm. know why critics bomb certain things, and like clearly this connects with the culture, and mm-hmm. it has. Almost a cult following because literally you go out into the real world, you will hear people reference or quote Joe Dirt still, mm. still. I yeah. think this movie is kind of up there in the same space with Grandma's Boy, which is another Happy Madison movie with one of his side guys, Alan Covert, mm-hmm. which weirdly has this like cult following, even though it wasn't a success. Yeah. Um, but yeah, this one more so, though. I do think that they set out to have at least some of the deeper themes. I don't know if they meant for it to go as deep as it did, but I think to get Dennis Miller to sign on, I don't think just knowing the Sandman is getting Dennis (laughs) Miller through your door. He was just getting cachet with his kids' friends. Yeah. (laughs) Um, But I, I do think that there had to be a little bit of substance. Yeah. I go back and forth through the entire movie. I'm like, no, they just set out to make a dumb comedy. Well, well, no, well. <laughs> and the thing is, Adam Sandler and David Spade both, I, they have deeper things to say at times throughout their careers, and they take different roles that are more serious. But on SNL, they're just the basically frat boys. Yeah. That make random sound effects and get all the screen time and all the ladies get upset. Well, what do you guys think? Listeners, do you like Joe Dirt? Is it one of your is it is it one of your favorites? For some people, this is a favorite movie. And it's weird. We kind of it kind of gets remembered around the fourth of July because of a couple scenes involving fireworks. Yeah. I don't know when it wraps up, honestly. <laughs> uh, so tell us what you think of this movie, where it occupies space in your pop culture consciousness. Probably has something to do with when you were born, if you were born in the 80s like Cody. Yeah, or before. the 80s, kid. <laughs> um, yeah, let us know on the social media post for this. Of course, subscribe and uh, review the pod when you can. Share it. And everybody have a safe and wonderful holiday weekend. We'll see you next time. Pop culture pastor. Pop culture pastor.